doing this and studying all of this because it's I, I've been learning a lot about uh, this book and what it means and uh, having a greater understanding for Yeshua and all that he does and what he's done for us. And uh, I, I even learned a lot this week, just in the last you know, couple of days in working on this passage uh, in Hebrews chapter 13. So just always keep in mind, you know, this was written to these Jewish believers in the first century who were being persecuted. They were being kicked out uh, of the temple. They were denied participation in the sacrifices and the feast days and all those types of things. And they were having to try to come to terms with that and what it means. And, uh, and they were being tempted. You know, they were being told, hey, we'll welcome you back if you give up this Yeshua, this belief in Yeshua as the Messiah. And so they've been asking that question, is it worth it? Is it worth it to hold on to faith in Yeshua? And as we've been going through the book of Hebrews, the answer has been unequivocally, yes. It is worth it to hold on to Messiah Yeshua. And so now if they've got that issue settled, if they're, they've stood on that and they're going to hold to that, then they have to struggle with the aftermath uh, of that conviction. They have to struggle with the consequences of that conviction. And, the, and they even have to deal with their own attitude that they may have, even toward their persecutors, the distrust that they may have toward their fellow Jews who don't know whether they're in agreement with the persecution or not. And so as we come to chapter 13, these first few verses deal with some very practical matters of loving your neighbor even in the midst of these kind of persecutions. And it's the kind of love that they should have, or the kind of love maybe that they shouldn't have. Yeah, the kind of issues that, that we may even be struggling with in our days more than we realize, especially as we see the love of many growing cold, and the Torahlessness, the lawlessness increasing, which we are seeing. So he starts out in chapter 13 by saying, you know, let brotherly love continue. Don't give up on it, on your love for each other, for those of, of the faith. But then he says, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. For in doing so, some have entertained angels without knowing. Then he says, Re remember the prisoners as if you were fellow prisoners, and those who are mistreated as if you also were suffering bodily. And these are important actions of love that they should not give up on, even though they may be hurt. You know, they may be feeling betrayed. You know, they're showing hospitality, even to strangers, like somebody showing up at the well and saying, hey, is there a place for me to stay at your house? We don't typically do that very much in our day. We're not the kind that says, hey, somebody shows up at the door and we welcome them in. We're pretty creeped out by that, right? I'm not alone in that, am I? Okay. But if they have, if we have that kind of faith, you know, we're going to have the same kind of faith that Abraham has. You know, he was mentioned back in uh, chapter uh, 11, but you know, he in chapter 18 of Genesis, you know, he welcomed these three beings to his tent. He made this meal for them, right? And he is, what is he doing? He is welcoming. Angels and not not even necessarily knowing. But it was in that moment he actually, in welcoming them, he heard about the promise. He heard about the son of promise being more born. And if you're welcoming, if you're remembering the prisoners as if you were fellow prisoners, you know, they may be you may be in prison unjustly. And you may be showing compassion to someone who may be in the same kind of position or same situation that you have found yourself in or you may find yourself in in the future, or you may be somebody a lot like in the situation that Joseph was in, one of the other patriarchs, when he was in jail, in prison in Egypt for unjust causes. And so right off the bat, he's calling them to follow the examples of even some of the patriarchs and even some of those who were ministering to the patriarchs. Then he goes on to another issue that we have in our day about marriage. He says, let marriage be held in honor among all, 
and the marriage bed kept undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterers. And what we've got to realize in this one is, is, you know, before there was any other kind of relationship, before there was a parent-child relationship, before there were a siblings relationship, before there was any kind of friendships, before any kind of business partnerships, or even before there were neighbors, there was husband and wife. So marriage is the very first defining relationship that God created among human beings. And what we're struggling with, you know, any culture that tries to break away from that, from God's design, what are we inviting? We're inviting his judgment. That's the reality of things. So he talks about hospitality and, and visiting those in prison. He talks about the importance of, of maintaining and establishing the, the significance of marriage. Then he talks about some kind of love that we're not supposed to have. He says, keep your lifestyle free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For God himself has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So that with confidence we say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What will man do to me? This is He's writing this to those who have been going through quite a lot in their day, in their experience, in their walk of faith. So many of these believers, he talks about in earlier chapters, of having their, their property and their, their their money and everything confiscated from them. So these are believers that may have had wealth at one time and lost it. Lost everything because of Yeshua. And others may have been offered even money and wealth if you'll just reject it. The world will do that. They'll take what you have because of Yeshua and they'll offer you something to give them up. And which should they, which should we love more when those times come to us. We love him more. And we are content with what we have. And we should not take it as a sense of that God is abandoning us. Our confidence should always be in his provision and not be driven by the fear that so often exists in us in loss of losing what we may have or what any authority can do to them or do to us. We must not be afraid of what they are threatening. And they should consider the example of their leaders, the leaders that have existed in the early church. At that time, you read back in Acts chapter 7, you read about a man named Stephen. What kind of faith did he have? When they threatened him, what kind of faith? Did he have the kind of faith that gave up or the kind of faith that stood his ground? He stood his ground, but what did it cost him? It cost him his life. We read about in Acts chapter 12, the apostle James, who was killed by the sword on the order of King Herod. That led to the arrest of Peter. Uh, or closer to the time of the writing of the book of Hebrews, In the 60s, there's the man that we we know him primarily as by the name James, but his name really is Yaakov or Jacob. He's the half-brother of Yeshua. He is said to have been thrown from an elevated point in the temple and then stoned because he survived the fall in order at the order of the high priest at the time. And it may have happened as early as A.D. 62. Now, I want you to see this this passage from a historian Eusebius about notice the timing of James's death in this account. Eusebius is quoting from Josephus. Uh, he also re records otherwise lost passages from a man named Hegesippus in the 100s. But according to Hegesippus, the scribes and Pharisees came to James for help in putting down these Christian beliefs, these beliefs in. Messiah, Yeshua as the Messiah. The record says, they came therefore in a body to James and said, we entreat thee, restrain the people. 
you ought to forgive my King James here. Uh, for they, they have gone astray in their opinions about Yeshua as, as if he were the Christ, as if he were the Messiah. So we entreat thee to persuade all who have come hither for the day of Passover concerning Jesus. For we all listen to thy persuasion, since we, as well as all the people, bear thee testimony that thou art just, and showest partiality to none. Do thou therefore persuade the people not to entertain erroneous opinions concerning Jesus for all the people, and we also listen to thy persuasion. So take thy stand then upon the summit of the temple, that from thy elevated spot thou mayest be clearly seen, and thy words may be plainly audible to all the people. For in order to attend the Passover, all the tribes have congregated hither, and some of the Gentiles also. So, what time of year is it that he... Because does he, does, does James do that? Does he tell him, you guys need to stop believing in Yeshua? No. And when he doesn't do that, what do they do? He's thrown off. So these events of James's death may still have been, were probably still being talked about by those believers in Jerusalem. And they may have been still being talked about when they got word of what happened to Peter, what happened in uh, traditionally in 64 AD. So just two years potentially after this, Peter is killed in Rome. And they would get word of that. So in light of those examples of men who would remind them of the lives of the faithful, from chapter 11. Remember chapter 11, the faithful people didn't always survive. He said, the writer of Hebrews says this in verse 7, Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you, and consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. What was the outcome of James's life? It was death. What was the outcome of Peter's life? It was death. What about Paul? Death. Almost all of them gave that kind of example of faith. And then he says to imitate their faith. Be willing to do that. Willing to lay down their lives rather than denying Yeshua. And when we are called, when we are willing and able to imitate that kind of faith, we'll be equipped to do his will. Which is really the goal and the, the, the direction of what Hebrews 13 is going to. You know, the starting point for being equipped to do his will, to, you know, to endure to the end, is knowing and trusting who Yeshua is. And holding firm to that, you know, and how you have to know that and believe that and hold to that, you know, despite all of the current situations that you may see and be experiencing in the moment, you know, the current persecutions, the current turmoil, the current even delay in his coming. So that they thought he was coming during all of their lifetime in that first century. And here we are. 2,000 years later, we're still waiting. Has, has there been a delay in his coming? Have some people given up on him because of that? Yes. Have some people started mocking faith in Messiah because of that? Yes. And so despite all of those situations, despite, despite the persecution and the delay, that does not change who he is and what he has promised. You see verse 8 where it says, Yeshua the Messiah is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What were we just singing about in the, the days of Elijah? So, who was, who is, who is to come. Asher hayah behoveh beyondo. So none of the attacks on Yeshua, none of the criticisms, none of the charges, none of the lies, and all the things that were being said about him change who he is. Your situations may change. Leadership may change. 
Attitudes may change. People may change. There may be betrayal. There may be loss of trust. There may be people that you never expected to let you down who do. But Yeshua is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so our current situation, our current experiences, how long we've waited for his return, does not, does not change the fact that Yeshua is the Messiah and that he died as the provision of God for our sins, that he rose from the grave on first fruits. The hard part is, is even in this day, in the book of Hebrews, in this day, people were coming up with all kinds of explanations, trying to make sense of what was going on, trying to make sense of who Yeshua was, and trying to make sense of what's taking him so long, and all the other types of things. And so he tells them, he warns them, don't get carried away by all kinds of strange, and that means like foreign, alien, new, or unheard of teaching. Because they're out there, aren't they? There's all kinds of things. But if he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, then everything of who he is and who he uh, will be is going to be consistent with who he was. Not just while he was walking around on earth, but who he was before the foundation of the See, no new teaching can come along and change who he is from the Tanakh, from the Torah. And if any new teaching comes along and tries to turn him into somebody or something else, don't get carried away by that. Then and today, this kind of situation is a problem of people getting carried away by all sorts of strange and new teachings. I mean, my goodness, how many times have we seen you know, some new video gets put up on YouTube with some new idea about the, about the calendar, about the Sabbath, about the day, about the Nephilim, uh, about something pagan or some news event that burns across the Messianic and the Hebraic world like wildfire. Have we seen that before? You know, whatever it is, you know, becomes or has been used to become the new test that identifies the faithful or, or identifies who's the ones that are still blind and who's had their eyes open to all the lies. And what it really does, what it really accomplishes those kind of moments is divide and conquer. Because that divides, it breaks up friendships, it breaks up fellowships, it draws in the undiscerning with fine sounding arguments as Paul talks about. You know, because anybody can make anything sound good. But here in the first century, you know, the, the strange new teachings about Yeshua, they were popping up all over the place. You know, that he didn't really die on the cross, or that the disciples stole the body. You know, that's part of the, the, the lore and legend about things. Or they were saying that, you know, he already has returned, and you just mixed, missed it. Or they were mixing Yeshua with Greek philosophy and uh, paganism, turning him into you know, a spiritual being, turning him into somebody who didn't really have a physical form. You know, all of these types of things are designed to destroy our hope and destroy our confidence in who Yeshua is and what he has promised and what he will do. They're meant to cut us off from each other and the true promises of God. And so then and now, we cannot be carried away by all the things that we hear, every rumor, every speculation, every dream or vision that people claim to have, or even the ones that say, you know, we found the Messiah, here he is out there. You know, Yeshua even warned about that. Don't believe. And don't go running out there everybody, every time somebody says they found the Messiah, he's out over here. So we are reminded to not get carried away by all of these types of situations. And so re the remainder of verse 9 is a good example for us of how Scripture can be very easily misunderstood and twisted. So it says, do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace and not by foods that have not benefited those 
occupied by them. Yes, amen. Apparently that was a, a great title. <laughs> You know, as much as I as much as I like the the U version app, you know that you have on your phone that's on the computer, you know you have that ability to compare various translations that many of which I've never even heard of. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Uh, sometimes it's very revealing to do that. So I want you to look at how some other translations uh, render this verse. This the first one is the contemporary. English version. I want you to see what they think that this verse means. It says, don't be fooled by any kind of strange teachings. It's better to receive strength from God's gift of undeserved grace than to depend on certain foods. After all, these foods don't really help the people who eat them. That was a little unclear, perhaps. This next one is the Good News translation. Don't let all kinds of strange teachings lead you from the right way. It is good to receive inner strength from God's grace. And not by obeying rules about foods. Uh-oh. Where did that come from? Where did it all of a sudden turn into rules about foods? Those who obey these rules have not been helped by them. Hmm. Uh, the New Living Translation. Don't be attracted to strange new ideas. Your strength comes from God's grace. Not from rules about food, there that one is again, which don't help those who follow them. Um, then there's one called the Passion Translation, which I've never really heard of before. It says, don't let anyone lead you astray with all sorts of novel and exotic teachings, or maybe exotic translations, you never know. It is more beautiful to feast on grace and be inwardly strengthened than to be obsessed with dietary rules which in themselves have no lasting benefit. Is there any bias in some of these translations about some ideas? Just a few. You know, where does the modern Christian typically want to take this verse? They typically want to take it to say, you know, this is just another one of those verses that, that we, tells us we can eat whatever we want. You know, all those Old Testament things about clean and unclean, you know, outlawing bacon cheeseburgers, or catfish is bad no matter what kind of southern fried batter you put on it, you know, all that other kosher-related concepts, all those really have no benefit to people who are obsessed by them. Right? You're just, you're just kind of not helping yourself by believing all of that stuff about food. That's how it's very often described and understood. But here's the strange thing, you know, all of those heroes of the faith that you've been reading about in chapter 11, would they have been keeping all of those dietary rules? Yeah. All their leaders in Jerusalem, would they have been keeping those dietary rules that they were instructed to follow their example? Including Peter, even in Acts chapter 10, he was still keeping those. Uh, did Yeshua keep those dietary restrictions? Yeah, yeah, he did. And has food or, or dietary rules even been an issue anywhere in the book of Hebrews so far? No. No, they haven't been talking about that at all. So if the passage isn't really about dietary laws, because that's really an inserted topic, then the next obvious place where most people go to is obviously means he's talking about communion. Right? It must be a rejection of the Roman Catholic idea of the, you know, the elements of grace or the sacraments. You know, that saving power and grace is you know, essentially transferred to you when you take it, or your salvation must be in jeopardy if you don't regularly take communion, or maybe if the priest you know, says and denies you communion, you know, that's in the news a bit. But that's another kind of struggle and issue, because... If it's about those types of things, did the Roman Catholic Church even exist yet when this was written? No. Neither had there all of those beliefs been invented yet. And really, if it was about communion, as we think of it, or we traditionally think of it today, is it saying anything good about it? 
I mean, it, it, it says, if it's about communion, which another, you know, the other translations may allow, it's saying that it really doesn't have any benefit to you. So, do you really want to make it about communion? Because it's not about that. So, if it's, if it's not about the dietary laws, and it's not about communion as we understand it, then what's the issue? And what has been an issue throughout Hebrews is the subject of the sacrifices. You know, in, in the temple. And uh, the Jewish believers, even their ability and allowance to participate in those events. You know, they were denied at the hands of the high priest to be included in the Day of Atonement and counted among as one of Israel. And if they were not allowed and counted among the people, they would not have been allowed to bring their sacrifices to the temple. Right? Whenever they were to come, they were not being allowed to do that, to make their offerings, many of which were supposed to be eaten, you know, either by the priest or others by the person themselves. I mean, that's, that's true of Passover, isn't it? They bring the lamb to the temple, they slaughter there at the temple, it's an appropriate offering. They take it back to their particular house or the uh, like an upper room type of situation, and they're supposed to eat it in the, the Seder type of meal. You know, the lamb for the family, the lamb for the group, is taken back to eat. And so if communion has any kind of connection to this passage, what is it in the context of? in the context of Passover. Because the Jewish audience that this book was written to in the 60s AD, they would not have separated communion into its own thing. That would not have happened yet. And they certainly would never have done that. Certainly not while the temple was still standing. And they were going to the temple on a yearly basis. That would have happened later in the more the Greek world, after the temple's been destroyed, not in the Jewish world with the temple still standing. But can you imagine how hard it would have been for them? Here are these, these Jewish believers in Messiah, the trauma of growing up in first century Israel, you know, as a man, you know, you're you're required to go to Jerusalem three times a year. You, you've been celebrating the Passover every year of your life that you can remember. And you're suddenly cut off from that way of life, and you're not allowed to do that anymore. Not because the temple is destroyed and nobody can do it, but because you've suddenly be, been deemed unworthy. You've suddenly been deemed illegitimate by the very high priest that you've always essentially respected and gone to to help you celebrate the Passover. All because of your joy and finding the long-awaited Messiah. So these believers have been cut off from the meal, the food that reminds them of who they are, remind, represents the redemption of God, and is a key and unique identifier as a descendant of Abraham to this day. To this day, Passover is a key identifier for the Jewish people. Even secular, atheist Jewish people who don't believe in God at all will oftentimes participate in the Passover because that's an identification of this is my heritage and background. And so this first century people, they've been cut off from the sacrifices, particularly Passover, and remember, what time of year was it that James or Jacob was killed? He was killed at Passover. That was, they, every time they approached the Passover after that, they would be reminded of how he was thrown from the temple. And so their hearts needed to be strengthened by grace. They need to rest and trust in that truth, in the grace of God given out in Messiah Yeshua, more than their participation in the things like the Passover or the sacrificed meal. Because this is the truth that in these things, you are strengthened by grace in your faith, not by foods that have been 
that have not benefited those occupied by, which also means walk in or that regulate their life by them. So I believe this is primarily referring to the Passover. Those who are occupied or who regulate their life by them are the priests and the ruling party. But what do they do? They reject Yeshua as the Messiah. And do they really gain any benefit by participating in the Passover if they fail to recognize who the Passover is pointing to? Yes, they may have the meal. They may have the Passover lamb that reminds them of the redemption from Egypt, but they are missing the Passover lamb who redeems them from the slavery to sin. 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Get rid of the old cement so that you may be a new batch, just as you are unleavened. For Messiah, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. <coughs> he is the one that makes the meal really significant. He is the one that makes the Passover have the greatest meaning. Yeshua is the Lamb. Yeshua, He is the benefit. And if you don't have Him, if you reject Him, you really gain nothing from keeping the Passover. Vicki and I were talking about that this morning. You know, that's interesting. <clears throat> Excuse me. That when Yeshua spoke, you know, when He was going through the Last Supper, what we call that, that he took up the bread and the, and the wine, and he used them to discuss what was happening and what was going on. Wouldn't he have had the lamb there at the table that had been offered at the temple? But he didn't take up the lamb and say, hey, this is my body. He took up the bread, and he took up the cup. And he used them. You now these are believers, Jewish believers. They would have had some trouble and problem now that they're being denied the temple. You know, if Yeshua made it all about the Lamb, they'd be in trouble. They would have a hard time because they were no longer able to have the Lamb. After all, there's only one place that you can bring the Lamb to make the offering. You can't just do it anywhere. It's either at the temple or it's nowhere. You know, just like Jewish people have a hard time coming to terms with life and faith after the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D. Once they have no altar upon which to make the sacrifices, then how do we do this? How do we live this? But again, he made it about the bread and the cup. Do we still have the bread and the cup? The next verse actually gives us something because Hebrews 13.10 says, We have an altar from which those serving in the tabernacle, which is the euphemism for the temple, they have no right to eat. So what altar is the altar talking about? There is an altar that these believers still had access to. And it's not the one on earth in Jerusalem. He's talking about the true tabernacle that our great high priest in the order of Melchizedek serves at. Look back at these verses from chapter 8 and chapter 9. Here's the main point being said. We do have such a Kohen Gadol, a high priest, who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, he is a priestly attendant of the holies and the true tent, which Adonai set up, and not man. Hmm. How would he be able to go into the holies? How would he be able to do all of that in the, in the tabernacle that is set up if there's not an altar of some kind, in some form? Verse 8 says, By this the Ruach HaKodesh makes clear that the way into the holies has not yet been revealed while the first tent is still standing. It is a symbol for the present time. Accordingly, gifts and sacrifices are being offered 
that cannot make the worshiper perfect with respect to conscience. That's the altar that they're, that they're complaining about, about not having access to. He says, these relate only to food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until a time of setting same things straight. So there's that food issue. It's talking about sacrifices and the altar. But verse 9, or I'm sorry, verse 11 goes on and says, But when Messiah appeared as the high priest, the Kohen Gadol, of the good things that have now come, passing through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered into the holies once and for all, not by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. Yeshua serves as the true tabernacle, at the true altar, as the priest in the order of Melchizedek. And why does he use the bread and the wine? Well, you remember back in uh, in Genesis when Abraham was coming back from rescuing his nephew Lot. What did Melchizedek bring with him when he came out to meet Abraham? Do you remember? The bread and the wine. Melchizedek was officiating, essentially, the opening covenant meal that established the Abrahamic covenant, under which the Israelites were redeemed from Egypt, and under which we too are saved, because the Mosaic covenant, covenant wasn't given until after they were already redeemed. And so where does Yeshua serve? He serves at the heavenly temple, where the altar is sprinkled with blood that is better than the blood of bulls and goats. That's his own. And these believers are represented at that altar. They still have access to that altar through Yeshua. And all of these earthly priests, even the high priest, because they are not sinless, because they are not in the order of Melchizedek, because they reject Yeshua as Messiah, they have no right to eat from that temple or from that altar. They can deny you food from this altar. They can deny you the Passover here on earth. But they have no authority to deny you the Passover lamb and the offering from the altar for which Yeshua serves. That's what he's getting at. So you don't need to worry about or be upset that you're kicked out, that you are denied entry, that you're considered outside the camp and cut off from the people, because you're going to be in good company if that's true of you. Because the holy things are taken outside the camp. Even on earth, you know, the blood of the sacrifices that are considered holy. They are taken into you know, the, the, the blood of the sacrifices that, that are considered holy is taken into the most holy place and sprinkled on the altar. But it's only the blood. I mean, what, what happens to the rest of them? What happens to the rest of the animal? Isn't the whole thing considered holy? But it too is excluded from the temple and removed from the people. Hebrews 13, 11 says like this, for the blood, for the bodies of those animals, whose blood is brought into the holies by the Kohen at old as an offering for sin, they are burned where? Outside. They're burned outside the camp. So what's left, you know, what remains after the blood has been collected is taken outside the city and burned. It's not wanted. It's not used for anything else. It's not even the high priest gets to eat the sacrifice that's there on the, the, the Day of Atonement. It is essentially cast out, just like they have been cast out, just like Yeshua was taken outside the city and killed. Verse 12, Therefore, to make the people holy through his own blood, Yeshua also suffered outside the gate outside of the city of Jerusalem. Yeshua the Messiah, he was rejected by the very same authorities that were rejecting these believers. He was maybe even some of the very same people, because some of them very well could have still been alive in leadership positions in the 60s that were there in the, the 30s when Yeshua was crucified. And he was cast out and crucified outside the city, and his blood was taken to the Holy of Holies of the tabernacle.
tabernacle in heaven. So he's essentially saying, don't feel bad that you are kicked out because they kicked him out too. And so he says in verse 13, so let us go to him outside the camp bearing his disgrace for here we have no lasting city but we seek the one that is to come. Just like he mentioned in chapter 11 with Abraham who was looking forward to the, the city whose architect and builder is God. These Jewish believers loyalty is not to the city of Jerusalem. It's not to the leadership that is there. Their loyalty is to the plan and purpose and promise of God as ours is. Their loyalty is to Messiah's kingdom and the new Jerusalem that is coming down. So don't be ashamed to leave. Don't be ashamed to be outside the city and bear that disgrace and even be called a traitor by those who are kicking you out. Because here's the, here's the kicker of things. They were living in days of fulfillment and judgment. Because Yeshua himself had predicted the fall of the temple. The and the timeline of this, these, these years is very interesting and very telling. So remember, James, he was thrown off the temple and killed in uh, at Passover in what year? Y'all remember? The earliest date is likely or possibly AD 62. And so the believers were experiencing this growing persecution. Hebrews is written in the mid-60s, before the fall of the temple. So he... James is killed in 62. Peter is killed in roughly 64. And then in the 66 starts the Jewish revolt against Rome. And they took over Jerusalem. Now what do you think happened? Do you think persecution increased or decreased when the, the, the zealots took over Jerusalem? It increased. It became harder. So these events of the, the Jewish revolts in the mid-60s is when this was written. And the Jewish believers historically fled Jerusalem in about 68 and 69 AD. And guess what they were called by those who remained in the city? You're traitors. You are giving up on the cause. And so you are you know, unworthy of all of these things. Of course, they were already being called that because they believed in Yeshua. And then in 70 AD, get this, three days before Passover is when Rome began the siege of Jerusalem. With four legions of their troops so that's on three days before Passover is one day after all of the Passover lambs have been brought into Jerusalem. They besieged the city with these four legions, and in just a few months, by what day traditionally? The ninth of Av, just a few months later, the temple and the city was destroyed. Hebrews was written in that context and in those days. And so perhaps when the Jewish believers fled the city in 68 or 69, they did so because they received instructions from this letter to go to Yeshua outside the camp. Because we have no lasting city. Hebrews. Don't be afraid to leave. Don't be afraid to flee to the hills, as Yeshua talked about in Matthew 24, to all those in Judea when they see the abomination of desolation. They must be like the generation who heeded the words of Jeremiah the prophet when Jerusalem was under siege centuries before by the Babylonians. They got the same message the believers did to leave. 
Jeremiah 38, thus says that on I, He that remains in the city will die by the sword, by famine, by plague, but anyone who goes out to the Chaldeans will live, so he will keep his life like the spoils of war, and will live. Thus, Adonai, thus says Adonai, this city will surely be given into the hand of the army of the king of Babylon, and he will capture it. Those that heeded the prophet's words, guess what they were called at the time? You guys are traitors. But it's ironically, it's those in the generation that heeded Jeremiah's words, those are the ones that lived. Those, the other ones were the, that stayed in the city died. And guess who the descendants, guess that most of the Jews in the first century when Hebrews was written, guess who they descend from? The ones who listened to Jeremiah and got out. So the Jews in the first century who were still alive were the ones descended from these people. But in the day of the Babylonian siege, the ones that were getting out were called traitors by those that remained in the city. Even Jeremiah, what happened to him when he was warning people, telling them, you need to get out? What happened to Jeremiah? He was thrown in prison. And he was still in prison when the Babylonians took the city. But just like they were called traitors by those that remained, the Jewish believers in Yeshua were being called traitors in the late 60s for leaving Jerusalem when Rome was coming. And that even happened again later, because there's a this is a pattern that repeats. The Jewish believers were late, called traitors in the late 120s and 130s by those leading what was called the Bar Kokhba revolt, because they were refusing to fight for the cause. They had been helping, but then they backed out because some of the rabbis pronounced that Bar Kokhba is the Messiah. And the Jewish believers were like, nope, we can't go there. We're not going to join you in the fight for a false Messiah. So by remaining true to the direction here in Hebrews 13, to go to Yeshua outside the camp because they don't have this enduring city, then they were able to do what comes next in Hebrews, which is through Yeshua then, let us continually offer up to God a sacrifice of praise and the fruit of lips giving thanks to his name. Do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Praise was their sacrifice. Doing good and sharing was their offering. Something they could still do with or without the altar, with or without the temple, with or without the priestly approval. And they would be encouraged to know that God is pleased with that kind of offering. And so the author is hoping to see that these Jewish believers He's hoping to see them again soon, because apparently he's been out traveling. Uh, verse 19 tells us about that. But to sum up all that he has said so far, what he calls, you know, it's 13 chapters long, and he calls this a brief word of exhortation. Uh, he says, the author, he encourages them to hold on and not give up their faith in Messiah Yeshua by blessing them, by praying for them, and saying this in verse 15. Let us continue to offer up this to God a sacrifice of praise. He is well pleased. And then, I'm sorry, then it goes on in verse uh, 20. Now may the God of Shalom, the God of peace, who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of an everlasting covenant, our Lord Yeshua, may he make you complete in every good thing to do his will, accomplishing in us what is pleasing in his sight, through Messiah Yeshua. And to him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. That's where he is hoping to take us. And so we too have to look to the God of peace, the God of shalom. We've got to realize that our circumstances are going to be repeating in many ways. And we've got to realize 
that he has given us everything that we need for life and godliness, to make us complete and mature disciples. And so we need to trust fully and completely in our good shepherd and the promises, not of a covenant that is passing, but an everlasting covenant, one that will not ever end. And so then we would be disciples that are truly ready for his kingdom to come, ready for Yeshua to be seen in power and glory, no matter how long it takes. We will be ready. So despite all that was occurring in their day, all the circumstances of their day, all that was happening in our day, and that we are concerned about, that we may see coming, the shaking of the world, essentially, we must fix our eyes on Yeshua and hold firmly to him. For the God of Shalom has carried us all this time. And he will continue to carry us every step of the way through all that is happening in our day. And our great high priest who serves at the heavenly altar will come for his bride and lead us through the fulfillment of all of the things that have yet to happen, all of the feasts that are yet to come, you know, crowned at the Feast of Trumpets, separate the sheep from the goats on Yom Kippur, and celebrate the wedding feast at Tabernacles. You know, the, 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 and the millennium, you know, the thousand year reign will begin, and all of these authorities that have persecuted you, that means that for them that every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Yeshua the Messiah is Lord to the glory of God the Father forever and ever. That's where we are supposed to come to. And so in spite of all the things going on, and all of the fears that we may have, in spite of all the persecutions and accusations that may even be coming in our day, Yeshua is, is worth more than all. Even our lives are worth His glory. 